afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone, uh, depending on where you're dialing in from. Very happy to have you here with us. Uh, this is a session on the opening day of Sankal on the topic of scaling blended finance in India. So blended finance is obviously a very interesting uh, topic. You know, it refers to, in my, in my opinion, everything between philanthropy and commercial investing, right? So anything which is an IRR between 5% and 25%, which is a lot. Uh, and of course, blending different types of capital, both private capital and public capital, commercial capital and development capital. And uh, this is a market which has been growing in India. So, you know, as you know, the impact bond started in the West. Uh, we've seen more than 100 of them, but there have also been some challenges in the market. Some people feel they've not scaled as much as they could have, or the cost structure is too high. But at the same time, it's a very powerful way to do development financing and to do collaborative work between the private sector and the public sector. So there's a lot of you know, benefits as well. Now, building this market in India has been going on for the last you know, half a decade or so, depending on who you ask. The market is still at a very interesting inflection point. Uh, but we do feel that it is growing and there's a lot of potential. So with that context, uh, this is a very exciting time. And uh, we're very, very pleased and privileged for this panel to have with us you know, some of the leading practitioners uh, who have helped build this market and who are continuing to do so and taking it to the next level, uh, as well as representatives from government. Because of course, blended finance, ultimately it's about you know, solving social outcomes, uh, including public expenditure and uh, you know, public goods. So how does government and private sector work best to do that? Uh, and we're doing this in two new interesting areas. Many of you would have heard many panel discussions on education, right? Which is a very important topic and all of the impact bonds that have happened here. But many people ask, what about you know, impact bonds in other areas? So two areas where we're gonna really focus on today. One is skilling and employment and the other is of course healthcare. So with that context, uh, what I'm going to do is just briefly, very briefly, uh, just introduce who our five panelists are. We've curated a very powerful panel to get, give you all of these perspectives. And then we'll go through, <coughs> excuse me, we'll go through one by one, each of the five panelists, because they're all very senior and they have a lot of perspectives to share uh, through sort of a guided discussion covering the key issues in blended finance. Uh, and if you'll just give me a moment, uh, I'll just pull up you know, my outline. But, but while I'm doing that, uh, firstly, let me just welcome all, all, all of the five panelists. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have all of you here. Uh, first, we have uh, Dhan. Uh, Dhan is, uh, you know, basically leads the social finance practice at UBS. Uh, she has been UBS Optimus. UBS Optimus is, uh, you know, part of the UBS Bank, and they have been one of the pioneers in development finance and social impact bonds globally. Uh, they have participated in many of these bonds, both in India as well as abroad. So what would be really, really useful, uh, maybe if we can start with you, Dhan, is if you can sort of kick us off and you know, give us a sense of where is the market today, you know? And also if you could introduce, you know, a little bit of the work of UBS in this area. What have you guys seen globally? Uh, if you wanna talk a little bit about developed markets, that's fine. But I guess what would be really useful is if you can talk about emerging markets, you know? Impact bonds in Africa, in Latin America. What's the overall context? How have these things been going? What's going well? And then applying it to India. What makes you excited about India? And let's say the next, four to five years. Where do you see the impact bond market placed in India? That may be a good starting point. You know, where does this market currently stand? Great, Karthik. Thanks. Um, thanks for that introduction. Um, so as you mentioned, the UBS Optimist Foundation has been active in blended finance and in building the, the ecosystem for international uh, development finance, uh, not just in India, but globally. Um, at the foundation, we basically tried to leverage our philanthropic capital in partnership with government to create more investable opportunities in emerging markets. Um, so whether it be, um, for example, by providing different forms of patient capital to make uh, enterprises more investment ready, so that's through grants, uh, convertible grants, or even public-private partnerships. 
um, or investing into traditionally uninvestable opportunities um, via impact bonds that allow us to invest in nonprofits who don't have um, a revenue model, um, or by de-risking investments uh, by providing first loss capital. So our focus has really been on creating tailored approaches with um, uh, incentives for investors, enterprises, uh, and donors alike to deliver on outcomes uh, through uh, largely performance-based uh, payment mechanisms. Now, as a philanthropic organization, we've piloted um, some of these innovative mechanisms like impact bonds, impact loans, convertible grants, um, gathered and are continuing to gather evidence around what works, what doesn't, and then replicated uh, these models. And now to our um, association with uh, a large bank, as, as Karthik mentioned, where um, we are associated with, with UBS, which is the world's largest private wealth manager, we are working on transitioning these ideas to scale. Um, so for example, one of the exciting things that we are planning to do with impact bonds is moving from individual transactions to a fund concept. Um, so what we're doing is designing a blended develop an impact bond investment fund, which will pool funds from different investors uh, to invest in about uh, 12 to 15 dibs globally. Um, now, it's a good opportunity to get to scale by blending the philanthropic capital, um, taking a first loss position, and catalyzing in turn more private capital, more commercial capital with higher return expectations. But where the returns are completely tied to the achievement of social outcomes. In our case, with, with the fund we're looking at, potentially uh, education, livelihoods, and health outcomes. Now, coming to the case of blended finance um, in India um, and the, the landscape and sort of how, how, how we see it poised to grow, um, even though blended finance has been around for quite a long time, it was really with the, um, with the sustainable development agenda and the framing of the sustainable development goals in 2015 that we saw it pick up momentum and gain attention as a critically important approach to mobilizing capital for the SDGs. Um, and so since then, it's become more of a familiar concept with development agencies, but also private foundations, uh, investors, impact investors, and banks alike. Um, so we've, we've seen that kind of growth in, in momentum. Now, around the same time in 2015, we in India saw the launch of the world's first development impact on in education, which was the Educate Girls Dib. Um, and that was successfully completed in 2018 with us, UBS Optimist Foundation as risk investor, recovering our capital and earning a return of around 15%. The dip proved a few things. It proved that quality and access to education can go hand in hand, uh, that the dip structure can work in India. And it is on the basis of that that we then uh, decided to scale up and launch two additional impact bonds in India, um, uh, one in education, another in healthcare at a much larger scale. Um, and looking at a few of the, the challenges we saw with the Educate Girls Dib, as well as other uh, dibs across the globe, uh, we tried to address these in the scaled versions of, um, of the education and health dibs, which are uh, the Quality Education India Dib and Utkrish Dib. Um, and what were these uh, challenges? Well, reducing transaction costs, which we managed to achieve through the scale dips, uh, and leveraging um, templates and, and contracts which have already uh, been developed so, so as to do, the, do so. We also worked on pooling funds. So rather than um, single entities involved in the transaction, uh, convening pool pools of outcome funding um, and also starting to create a market for outcomes by working with several implementers all at once. So that all delivering the same outcomes, but so that you can see which implementers are operating most effectively and most efficiently in the space. Um, with our work in Utkrish Dib, uh, which is focused on maternal and newborn health, uh, we've seen currently that despite um, COVID, we have been able to uh, continue with, with our efforts. And COVID has uh, posed an interesting problem in healthcare. While there has been a surge of funding towards healthcare programming, uh, this has, of course, been more towards medical assistance, uh, emergency COVID relief. And we have seen uh, other areas of healthcare face um, somewhat of a, a shock. So household spending on health uh, is lower. Um, there is limited coverage of insurance policies. Donor funding towards areas like maternal newborn health have um, has reduced and or been re redirected towards COVID. Um, and so we see it as 
an interesting opportunity in healthcare, particularly to use blended finance to really make the most of the limited pool of um, funding that is available from private philanthropic foundations, um, um, public sources alike to to really catalyze that private investment and bring it into the space. And we see that particularly in the, in the area of uh, non-state provision of healthcare. Um, all this to say that there is a very strong foundation for the growth of impact bonds uh, in India from the very first Educate Girls did in uh, 2015, just five years ago. We're now very delighted to note that there are several impact bonds actually in design in India, uh, looking at very creative iterations of the model. And with a number of ecosystem players having also uh, come up well in country. Um, so what beyond the impact bonds? Um, I'd like to take a few minutes to also talk about some models uh, uh, other than the impact bond um, framework. And, and uh, one of the, the models that we've really uh, worked on um, and um, has been the, the uh, social success note. And the ASHA team actually together with the Aspen Network um, have put together a fantastic playbook on social success notes, which I'd encourage everyone to read. Uh, it features uh, a first of its kind success note that the UBS Optimist um, Foundation um, has been involved with uh, in Uganda with an implementing partner called Impact Water that delivers basically safe drinking water solutions to schools uh, in Uganda, thereby um, increasing student attendance, basically by reducing absenteeism caused by waterborne illness and, and therefore driving better learning outcomes for these children. Now, unlike impact bonds, the underlying implementer in the success note is a for-profit social enterprise with a strong revenue model. Uh, but social enterprises like Impact Water often struggle to attract investment due to high perceived risks and low margins. And so to maintain their social mis mission as well as market re uh, return expectations by investors, they often run the risk of mission drift. The success note in many ways helps to address that challenge. And so what we've seen is basically um, an investor optimist foundation providing concessionary loan uh, to Impact Water, uh, uh, which is an enterprise that is small to mid-size and that is able to service low cost debt um, and with a strong uh, impact model. Uh, and the impact of these um, enterprises must be easy to measure in this case because quant uh, that's, that's critical to the success of the, the model. Um, and if Impact Water basically achieves their predetermined social outcome, um, a philanthropic outcome payer, in this case, the Rockefeller Foundation, will pay us back as, uh, as risk investors. So um, that is an additional incentive depending on the achievement of outcomes for the risk investor. It basically ensures a competitive or close to competitive risk adjusted rate of return for um, an investor, making the in instrument more attractive um, for private sector players to come in. Um, and the outcome payer may also choose to provide an incentive to the social enterprise that's operating as well. So the social success note is another example of a model that can really align incentives across players, providing uh, businesses with access to um, a mission aligned capital and making investments attractive to private and commercial investors. So um, with that, I've basically discussed two models today that we've, uh, you know, we've worked with extensively in, in India and in other markets, um, and where we see uh, at the foundation uh, that there is tremendous opportunity for, um, for replication and scale uh, in India. And I just practically like to leave with two messages. One is, there is a lack of investable opportunities, but if we use blended finance approaches, we can um, address that. And the second is, it's really important to note that there is no silver bullet solution for all sectors and all types of interventions. So we really must adopt the model that is best suited and then adapt it um, to be fit for purpose. Thanks, Karthik. Great. Thank you so much, Dhan, um, for that uh, fantastic overview. And we're genuinely very, very excited about the potential uh, for growing this market in India and seeing UBS getting so active here with all of your global experience and we'll be coming to social finance soon and hearing from Shantanu on what they're doing. And I just wanted to leave one thought in your head for the next round, you know, before I move uh, to the next speaker, which is how do investors, risk capital, whether it's H&Is or whoever it is, impact investors, think about risk and return, right? These instruments are earning some percentage return between five and 10%, whatever it is, you know? So do they think of it as commercial capital or philanthropic capital? How does one really get risk capital? And how do, how do investors think about it? So we'll park that question for now, but I wanted to move 
uh, now to uh, to Avneet. Uh, uh, Ma'am, welcome. Uh, it's such a pleasure to to have you here. Uh, briefly, you know, uh, Avneet works at uh, NSDC, and uh, she's a, a PhD from Cambridge and has been a policy consultant, policy researcher, uh, and currently heads international collaborations and corporate strategy at the National Skill Development Corporation. And NSCC, as many of you would know, is you know, a, a fairly a well-recognized proactive entity. It has been in, you know, in this space for some time uh, in terms of public-private partnerships you know, and sort of creative thinking and looking at uh, how do you really create outcomes uh, versus the traditional way. So uh, NSCC has, I think, been looking now a little bit at blended finance, different models, both impact bonds as well as, you know, uh, other structures like social success notes. So I mean, it'll just be wonderful, you know, because many people in this industry and Sankalp is like the preeminent platform for the social enterprise sector. So, you know, it's like our annual Mela. So every year when we get together, people ask, government kahan? When will the government get involved in impact uh, investing or in blended finance? So could you just uh, walk us through a little bit what specifically uh, you are doing at NSDC and this larger question of government, whether it's NSDC or other entities, how are they starting to look at it? What do they like about blended finance? What do they don't? What are the risks? So, you know, how are you looking at it and how optimistic are you about uh, the engagement here? And of course, the specific initiatives that NSD is working on currently, if you could talk to us a little bit about that, that'd be uh, wonderful. Sure, uh, my pleasure. And thanks, Karthik. Uh, thanks for having me here. And it was really nice listening to Dhan as well about all the uh, interesting options that they are working with. Uh, and NSDC would be keen to explore. And on your, you know, basically on your question on where is the government, that's an answer that we've been trying to find as well. But let me quickly run you through the process that we are at uh, as we speak. Um, so um, you see, NSDC is a public private partnership, the National Skill Development Corporation for Everyone's Benefit that was founded in 1999 with uh, shareholding of private industry chambers and uh, the Ministry of Skills Development and uh, Entrepreneurship. So NSDC, uh, we would like to believe is well positioned to leverage both the industry and the government and thereby bridge you know, the ideological gap between the private impact investor and the public funder. Uh, so traditionally, if you look at it, uh, the skills ecosystem, when it started a decade ago, it was mostly dependent on government grants. And uh, NSDC towards uh, fulfilling its mandate of creating a market-led competency-based skill development system has provided loans and grants to various partners and created a vibrant environment today that comprises of over 200 training partners that operate uh, around 11,000 training centers with an annual capacity to train something like 5 million persons a year. Uh, NSDC has also incubated 37 sector skill councils that have certified uh, an impressive 26 million people in the last 10 years uh, through a cadre of over 70,000 uh, certified trainers and assessors. So, you know, all these numbers tell that the system is now mature and stable, which makes it less uncertain for private investors. And in fact, there is keenness now from the private sector to participate. Uh, NSTC is therefore exploring various innovative outcome-based financing instruments uh, with the aim of encouraging private sector funding and more importantly, improving the quality of skills outcomes uh, and not only quantity, which typically happens to be the case in large scale government grants. Uh, in fact, uh, NSDC, uh, Karthik is looking at the entire spectrum that you mentioned, right from, from grants at one end to uh, VC funding at the other end, and you know the in-between uh, impact uh, funds that we are talking about here today. Um, uh, for instance, uh, we have recently partnered with the British Asian Trust as co-investors to uh, co-risk investors to launch the first of its kind impact bond, which is called the Beyond COVID Skill India Impact Bond. Uh, and through this bond, uh, we aim to tackle various challenges, uh, particularly that have arisen in the wake of the pandemic as well. Uh, and also given the gender focus of one of our outcome funders, through this SIB, we will be able to particularly focus on improving skilling and employment outcomes for women. Um, in addition, we are also considering other blended finance solutions such as skill loans. Uh, we are engaging with Social Finance India and Shantanu is here for uh, creating sustainable livelihoods by providing uh, affordable skills.
scaling loans to low income youth uh, and nsdc as the anchor investor uh, we believe that uh, we will be able to use the grant budgets of philanthropic donors as first loss uh, default guarantee which can increase the scale and impact and build the market for affordable uh, loans in the long term uh, so we hope to you know actively in the long term work with many such instruments and tackle various wicked problems that otherwise remain unaddressed um so i'll stop here for now unless you want me to speak a bit more on the uh, on how the government plans to get in uh, now or should i do that later kartik you know we'll do another round but this is so fantastic so and i wanted to just frame each each point so so thank you for that abhi i think uh, the question that comes to my mind also which I, which i love for you to all panelists to think about for the second round is the nature of the interventions itself and as you mentioned nscc is doing an impact bond with that uh and uh you know scaling loans with that's if i there could be other instruments working with different providers uh so the point i'm simply trying to make is many people when they talk about impact bonds they talk about the benefit of leveraging capital that you know by putting some government capital you get more private capital of course that's a wonderful thing but it's also about what's the right intervention model that there's a lot of activities going on out there so we who work in social you know impact say that there's a correct way or the right way to create that outcome and the risk capital is identifying that intervention and putting his or her capital at risk so it's a better way of doing it and it links back to the question i asked han which is how do we convince risk capital to actually even come in it's easy to say but when you go to hnis or investors often they don't get it so we're all working towards you know how do we mobilize and get more and more people to do this so i think the example of nscc trying different things is the perfect example of that saying that there is no silver bullet but you need to really think about what's the right approach uh, for each sector uh, so just coming to shantanu now building upon uh, uh, what i've need mention just a very brief introduction uh, shantanu is the ceo of uh, social finance india for those of you who don't know social finance is a global entity set up by sir ronnie cohen in the uk so there's social finance uk social finance usa and so forth and social finance india was set up recently uh, and uh, you know chantanu uh, prior to heading it i think uh, he he was uh, had a long and very illustrious career at, at ge uh, general electric you know uh, he was a cfo of it he led uh, uh, genpact so uh, had a very illustrious you know career as a very successful professional and then i think about 3 4 years back wanted to transition to the social sector so welcome uh, chantanu wonderful to have you here and uh, so the question i wanted to ask you is the following uh social finance as as we mentioned is a global leader in building the impact bond market and pooling structures right that dhan had also spoken about because one of the criticisms of impact bonds is that they're too bespoke as well as working with governments right ronnie cohen and and you guys have worked very closely with governments so could, if possible could you just share a little bit of highlights of what social finance's global experience has been the success stories and challenges like outcome funds that you guys have set up for us or africa and therefore what are you looking to do in india and the second question if i could just add it in is on skilling of course an area that you guys are looking at so closely uh and you're looking at technical skilling right software engineering allied healthcare which is good because those are very high quality interventions where several thousand rupees or even dollars have to be spent on a particular individual to skill them up in the right way but then typical investors like us or development investors are used to like very very high outreach metrics so how are you looking at you know the scale outcome cost challenge in scaling so if you could just share your thoughts on this shantan sure thanks so thanks karthik for the introduction and and the tee up um so i think from a global perspective social finance has predominantly worked with the government um it started in uk working with the government in terms of the department of corrections and started with uh, you know how to get rehabilitation for people who are coming out of uh, incarceration um and then if you look at the work that has happened mostly in the uk as well as in the uh us uh, almost 95% of the programs have had government as outcome payer which basically meant that there were very deep collaboration with the government to work on it and it led through impact bond structures but it has now moved into bunch of different things for example in us there is an income shared agreement model there are a bunch of other models that is going on and i think where it has gone also is beyond just uh, syndicating uh, funds for a program to actually becoming an outcome and pay for success consultant across the world 
um, and that's really the evolution that has happened in UK and US, which are the two scaled entities. And uh, you know, Israel and Netherlands is at an early stage, and then so is uh, India. Now, shifting to India, I think the way we have thought of our our role here is really not to start with the concept of what is the financial structure. Uh, I am a very firm believer that the form must follow the function. So what are we trying to solve for? Uh, what we are trying to solve for uh, or help in the development sector is to do three things. One is to co-design and co-create large long-term programs, which are extremely outcome focused in whatever we do. Now we have started with education and we have gone into livelihood and skilling. Um, so that's point number one. Point two is we would like it to be very focused on pay for success. And what does pay for success translate into? It basically says that the cost per beneficiary or cost of the program in whichever uh, unit you want to denominate it with must differ for different levels of outcome received. And therefore, you know, everyone who's involved in that ecosystem will have a different payout receipt, whatever it is, based on the different levels of outcome received. So those are the two fundamental uh, points. The third point, which is very, very important, for at least from a personal perspective, is to see how do we get leveraged levels of capital in here? So one of the things is to get, uh, you know, commercial capital come in and take the initial risk and then have it cycled back with impact capital. And that's really the function of the impact bond. And that I think is serving its purpose well. But we also need to think about how to get leverage commercial capital, which is where guarantee structures and, and those models come into play. So uh, let's, I'll take a minute to talk about what we have done in India. So what we have done in education in India is to really do a Haryana early education structure where for the first time in India, we have used CSR money. And we are achieving the first two objective, which is the complete outcome focus over a three year period. Um, the pay for success metric because the levels of payment will be different. But instead of using commercial capital, we are using a guarantee from another philanthropic uh, body, another foundation to create that first two uh, and put a stake on the ground on the first two criteria. Now, the work that we are trying to do with uh, NSDC stems from three fundamental beliefs. The first belief is that in India, one of the problems of the skilling market, which is why there has been doubts about the, the efficacy and the effectiveness of the interventions has been the fact that there seems to be a mismatch between the level of demand quality and the supply quality of skilling. And part of that is because of the throughput model that has been taken through a lot of the government subsidized and the, and, and the funded model, which is really 90% of skilling in India. To the point that Karthik, you alluded to, uh, we believe there are two things that needs to happen. One is the market needs to move towards more specialized higher end skilling which really creates skills which can command a reasonable amount of compensation in the market and therefore allow people who go through that process to be invested in their careers in those kind of areas as opposed to you know just do it and then figure out that this is not what I wanted to do. I've spent three months doing a training. It didn't cost me anything. So it's okay for me to do something else kind of model. The second is this market can only be scalable finally when beneficiaries pay for it. Okay. Now the challenge with that model is that the people who require it most, the vocational kind of skilling, are predominantly come from economically weaker sections and what we call, you know, the low income youth, right? And India is, you know, in terms of its demographic profile, is, is going to have that, that throughput from that particular segment for the next 10, 15, 20 years. So what we try to do with NSDC is to say that, look, Let's try and create a market. What is the problem? Now, these kind of people do not get the credit today because they are not underwritable. For underwriting, you need to have financial history. You need to have a, a track record where price and risk discovery has happened. So 85% underwriting rejects. The second is those who finally get loans, get loans through an effective cost, which is anywhere between 22 to 30% IRR. Um, if you talk to any of the NBFCs which are in this field, they will tell you that. So the, the idea with NSDC was very simple. The idea was to say that, can we catalyze a market where through moving 30, 40, 50,000 such students, we are able to create price and risk discovery. But how do you move the first 30, 40, 50,000 students? Um, and that is where two things come in. One, there is philanthropic money in this sector also. They come in form of grants, scholarships, and, and a whole bunch of different ways. Why don't we convert 
a grant which goes to one person to something that guarantees you know the default for 10 people and therefore you are able to get 10 times the capital from a commercial perspective come in and be in the market so that's really was the thought process and it took us a few months to talk to a bunch of players we are very happy to note that nsdc has been very very active in helping us think through this and is now a core designer of this program apart from committing a sizable amount of capital almost uh, uh, 15 million dollars uh, as as the first of a concessional capital as a loan capital uh, through its uh, letter of intent um, and we are talking to a couple of foundations which are at the guarantee level pool level so we have the initial uh, you know setup to build this up the last point i'll make here is that um uh, there is a bunch of other programs we are trying to do in the education space in the higher education in both primary secondary education where we are combining different types of instruments there is a classic impact bond structure for one area because that seems to be the form that best suits that function and there are variations of the guarantee model that we have done in haryana where there are three other programs which is on that so we are very excited by the fact that we can bring in variations to the theme to achieve the purpose which is you know enhanced leverage and 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 one last point kartik before i hand it over back to you if you look at the metrics of leverage on the nsdc program you know which is potentially how much annual income is created versus every dollar spent it is an order of magnitude better than what gets done through the you know government subsidized program programs and when i say order of magnitude i'm not talking 20% 30% i'm talking 5x 10x kind of model if you look at how much commercial capital can come in for every dollar of philanthropic capital that's anywhere between 6 to 8x kind of money so the whole model and don't i think refer to this which is the transaction cost and the efficacy of the money that gets used i think the nsdc program is going to set very different benchmarks for the efficacy of money being used in the sector in blended finance yeah so no, thanks shantanu we're all very excited about this you know uh, as as, fo as folks who've been looking at the uh, impact on market uh, and social success notes I, i you know it's a point about the right intervention model that scaling and other sectors all have their own challenges and they've been going on for a while so how do you use these capital tools to actually improve that performance uh, which is what you know this is all about and how do you then create scale by attracting lots of commercial capital that's only going to happen once these issues are addressed so it's wonderful to see social finance doing doing that uh and now uh moving on to our next speaker and slightly changing the 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 topic towards another sector which is healthcare uh i'd like to welcome uh, welcome mr shravan hardikar uh to the, to the conversation thank you very much sir for for being with us uh mr hardikar is the municipal uh, commissioner of uh, pcnc which is the uh, civic body that governs uh, pimpri chinchwad which is the extended city limits of pune uh you know this was established in 1982 uh, they have about 128 councillors and uh, mr hardikar has been the municipal commissioner uh, since april 2017 uh, uh you know and it's really wonderful to have you sir because you know we were talking earlier with avneet broadly about the role of government right in engaging with the private sector to unlock capital for development and specifically i wanted to add here the role of local government right the state a national government can set policy frameworks agendas etc but really the action is at the local level as we have consistently seen in india and this is of course not just in healthcare housing waste management transportation etc and that's what impacts the quality of life of so many of us right in tier 1 cities tier 2 and tier 3 cities like uh, pimpri chinchwad and the last point i'll add for the audience's benefit is that relative to many other cities you know pimpri chinchwad is a reasonably a very well run city and they also have a reasonable level of uh, uh, industrialization so this is really the question that everyone has that how do you really take that and dramatically improve the performance so hardikar sir has been looking at partnering with different folks you know asha impact and other 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 uh, in, you know development sector people to figure out how can an impact bond be created specifically for pcmc like the utkrishna impact bond where the government itself becomes the outcome funder so thank you again sir for 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 being with us and with that context i'd like i'd like to quickly ask you three questions okay number one what is the thought processor behind this uh, how did you even come up with the idea and the government wanting to do impact bonds right number one number two 
you know, what, what do you feel are the principal challenges? Difficulties will come where? One is, of course, the procurement process, maybe after that in the deployment, and how comfortable is the government paying returns, if any? Because sometimes, you know, the risk capital needs a small return. And the third question is, you know, we'd love for you to focus on PIMPRI and, 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 and healthcare, but how else can this be scaled up, sir? If I can ask you, what other municipal, uh, you know, areas, what, how do we then, do you see other government departments also expanding this? And, uh, you know, basically how do we, and, and not just other government departments, let's say this, this bond in PIMPRI is successful, should it then not be scaled to 20 other cities in Maharashtra? You know, so these three questions, how do you think about it? What are the challenges and what does the future hold? Thank you, Karthik. And sorry for joining a little late, uh, but I hope I have not missed much. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank all of you for organizing uh, this specific panel on social impact bonding bonds or uh, to be precise, I think on blended finance. Uh, we in government, especially at urban local bodies, are uh, pretty uh, excited about this new form of financing. Uh, mostly, most of the government funding goes to create an impact. But unfortunately, over the years, we have learned that, we have seen that, we end up investing for outputs than actually measuring into impact how much it has been created. So we would like to definitely move from funding for outputs, funding for inputs, than funding for the impacts and performance phase uh, system. This would be an ideal one. Uh, we got to uh, you know, interacting with various organizations like Asha Impact and some uh, consultants like Palladium who has been uh, implementing first social impact bond in Rajasthan, Krish. After knowing that model, it, it, it shows us a window of opportunity for government also to come as an impact funder in a sector which has or poses higher amount of risk in its implementation. But it is a nascent sector, it is a new se sector, we don't know how to go about it. And that's why we want to be uh, engaging with all the players into this domain. I know this is a new domain in India. Even across the other countries, there are uh, experiments being done, not yet uh, we have implemented a specific model as such. But I would just like to uh, put forward my idea in brief. Uh, in Pimpri Chinchwad, what we are trying on the background of this pandemic of COVID-19 is that we wish to transform our healthcare space from merely uh, output giving or merely uh, referral-based system to uh, enhancing the quality of life, quality of living, and looking at health and wellness as a principle. So in order to do this, we wanted to transform all our uh, healthcare uh, centers, right from dispensaries to our tertiary care hospitals into a measurably, uh, into a system where a quality of service can be perceptively enhanced and not just enhanced, it has to result into quality of life for the people in at large. So this is what we are looking at. And I'm, uh, when we go into the details of it, we see that it's a layered implementation mechanism. So as uh, rightly pointed out by Mr. Shantanu is that I think we should start uh, cautiously in this uh, uh, paradigm shift uh, with investing into uh, consulting space initially and then slowly move on to uh, actual impact creation or implementation phase because a uh, lot many things we know that there are risks involved into achieving outcomes. I would just highlight four risks and four problem areas that we uh, find uh, answering to your specific question. The first problem that we see is how to procure both the risk funder or the impact uh, uh, risk financer or, and the implementer, uh, both the agencies and how to merge both of them. This is the first question which obviously comes to my mind because we have this tedious uh, process of tendering and public procurement system. And I think this is our opportunity. We want to work with uh, whosoever is willing to partner with us on this first uh, project that we are building 
we are going to UNDP for technical assistance. We also want to work with Niti Aayog and anybody who is willing to work with us, or World Bank or anybody who has that uh, repository of knowledge and experience of doing social impact bonds in urban space, uh, in government space. We would be happy to work with you guys. Uh, we also have second thing: how to calculate the risk premium per se, because quantifying risks in PPP is what we are used to. But in a social uh, space, we are yet not very akin to identifying the risk premiums that will have to be put on to various processes and uh, interventions that will have to be done. Uh, third party assessment of the output outputs and impacts actually is not much of an issue because in social space, we are very much uh, used to doing the uh, impact assessments of various projects. But I think this is a tricky thing when we are going for financing the contracted, uh, uh, you know, outcomes and uh, actual funds are going to get dispersed based on this impact. It has to be really uh, uh, made into a very uh, crisp document which has no ambiguities left, and that's what going to be a little challenge. And finally, uh, one question that comes to my mind is: We are a progressive nation, so we keep on adding lot many laws and rules and regulations over the years, learning from our past. So, if I am doing something which has got a risk today, uh, and I take a social impact bond, uh, assuming that something will be done innovatively for the future. But in the process of implementation, the law changes and it mandates us to do that thing that we have set out to do uh, per se. For example, uh, I'll just give you an example that if I'm going for a particular uh, certification to be done for a particular vehicle, a PUC norm, that it has to be uh, you know, European Standard 4 or European Standard 6, and I'm allowing Standard 4 right now, and suddenly, I decide that I want to convert for pollution control to the sixth standard in the next two years. And in the meantime, government changes the norm and makes it mandatory for everybody to convert. Then how do you segregate the impact creation from the change in law? This is going to be the one question which I anticipate for government space in many of the uh, sectors that we want to work. And I see a lot of opportunity. I don't know that this is not a very a uh, big issue as of now, because this is just the beginning, we can start work. Uh, but four areas which I find are most promising for working in this sector of uh, blended financing for urban space and especially in government space. Uh, first question and first point that comes to my mind is use of innovative technology. This is the key area of intervention where a lot of impact uh, financing can come because we don't know, we are you know, pretty uh, slow on understanding and adopting technology. We are the slowest, I would say, but we are the people who face that lot many people are coming up with innovative technologies and interventions to deal with so many new problems. And I know the, this innovation space uh, uh, is really exciting, but if we can try out certain impact bonds on innovation space, maybe in the AI sector, maybe in robotics, data analytics, uh, you said, Kartik, to yourself, waste processing, you have already done some work on waste processing. But every day in and day out, we get so many entrepreneurs coming in and selling us new technologies. We don't know whether they will really impact or not. And this is one space which is actually we are keen to uh, explore on social impact bonds or uh, blended financing or risk financing, where we become the uh, impact investors per se. Second section sector that I feel is really tricky to handle today and which is shown a very important uh, essential sector which we need to uh, tackle is slum rehabilitation. The uh, very uh, important aspect for various uh, social entrepreneurs, we only have a developer based model which is revolving around only on financing and financial risks, but there are so many social risks involved in slum rehabilitation that uh, we are just shifting horizontal slums into vertical slums in the whole process. So we need to revamp this entire model, bring out a quality of life expansion for the poor slum dwellers, and also ensure that we have a, a rehabilitation program with renewal uh, principles in, in that with actual risk financing model. Uh, health sector, uh, I've already said a little about it. 
we are looking at quality of service improvement in a finite amount of time and finally there are uh, urban poor and urban uh, livelihood sector which i see like hawkers management it's again a tricky issue which every city is plagued with we don't know how to manage our hawkers internationally there is a uh, really nice ways in which uh, southeast asian cities have managed hawkers uh, per se to the advantage of the city to pro promote the city culture and making sure that we have uh, we do good for our poor people also but we need to work a bit better on this sector i think these are the sectors where a lot of blended financing tools can be worked out not just social impact bond but many other performance uh, pay for performance kind of initiatives and we would like to partner with all of you who have innovative ideas on that pcmc is one corporation which has a bandwidth to finance for such things many others would definitely look at corporations like mumbai new delhi bangalore chennai pune pcmc like corporations who have bandwidth in money who can uh, take some risk in this kind of innovative models and then once these models are uh, formed up uh, with some kind of an experience maybe uh, smaller mid sized uh, smaller cities would uh, follow the suit and when the government guidelines can uh, can be elaborated but i think this is my initial thoughts um, we are here to learn from all of you we would love to look at the report that you come up with and we would like to learn and uh, collaborate and partner with many many of you thank you thank thank you very much sir this is really music to our ears you know uh, the fact that um, that uh, you're looking at this and looking at it so seriously and and the points that you highlighted right the the, the four challenges of procurement quantifying the risk premium assessing impact and the legal risk that you mentioned it shows the depth at which this is actually happening and frankly it's in tier 2 cities you know there's so many of them in india from a chandigarh to a you know a, you know trivandrum to what have you and frankly it's often in the tier 2 cities that the best work happens right indore is the cleanest city in india and asia it keeps winning these awards now other cities are learning from indore waste management pimpri as you said is doing so many interesting and amazing things and if you know someone has to take that initiative and leadership you know as you said so if if you or two three other cities do it only then we can see it scaling to other areas so you know thank you very much uh, for your leadership uh, coming coming uh, now to ravi from uh, ipe global and kind of continuing on this topic only uh, so ipe global is a large development consulting firm uh, it does a lot of fantastic work in the area of healthcare and in the area of development finance and they are managing the blended finance facility for uh, the national health authority of india the nha funded by usaid uh, so ravi if i can just ask you to share a little bit more about that you know just talk to us a little bit about uh, within the context of healthcare which i know you guys focus on what are really the challenges that you're trying to solve and how does this samrit initiative solve these challenges right because here we're talking about pretty mega initiative where the nha uh, is sponsoring it the usaid is there so if you could just i guess help us answer the question what's the right model for public private collaboration in healthcare building upon what mr hardiker said and what you guys are looking to do at ipe global thank you parthik uh, so i was a bit uh, feeling at odd on the title of the discussion itself scaling of blended finance because the baby is just beginning to crawl and uh, we are asking the baby to fly so as shantanu said and others uh, very clearly said that we have to develop a significant level of used cases before we uh, talk about scaling uh, thanks for this opportunity and phenomenal points placed by the previous speakers uh, so before i go into sharing the features of this enormous initiative i would like to place some of the challenges that we uh, were thinking on for us to address before uh, setting out to design this uh, program so healthcare as you rightly said in the beginning has been a very challenging sector uh, and therefore has attracted limited amount of attention on the uh, blended finance or innovative finance space we don't have too many uh, precedences uh, to say or speak about uh, uh, primarily because uh, of some of the key challenges that come forth uh, and which in some sense inhibiting the innovation uh, to progress or flow through further 
So uh, many of the innovations are characterized by high upfront costs, high capexes, long gestation periods, heavy reliance on technology, which is uh, forthcoming. Uh, the good news is that the government has come up with a lot of uh, startup support programs in the form of uh, DST, supporting over 1,500 innovations, close to a billion dollars have been uh, funded and supported. And the other arm of the government, the BIRAC, has supported close to 1,000 plus startups and 1,000 odd crores has also been dispersed. But uh, the point is that uh, many of the impact investments look for time optimization, uh, quick geographical reach, and bringing down the costs. It puts a, puts a lot of pressure on the innovator or healthcare enterprises. Uh, also, uh, the other fact is uh, the healthcare enterprises are broadly focusing on product or solution or technology, uh, which is at the supply level and the demand side is, uh, is kind of coming much later in the picture, which sometimes is it's too late. Uh, many of the surveys on startups in healthcare and the uh, uh, progress of the healthcare in this space have uh, reaffirmed the fact that the biggest stumbling block is lack of access to appropriate capital. So much so that 85% of the capital comes in the form of equity, leaving only 15 or less percentage space for debt or hybrid, which is very emerging. So because of the long gestation period after the burn of the initial equity capital, which is now having a better access compared to what it was, uh, they struggle to be funded uh, to the uh, remainder of the gestation uh, period. Second is uh, regulatory challenges. Right? Predictable pathway is not there for them to obtain the licenses and approvals. The new emerging innovations in the form of health tech, med tech, SaaS as a service, the policy is still unclear as to how the licensing works. Uh, many of them have found and knocked on the doors of the regulators are still yet to find a solution as what kind of approvals are required for them to be making it available for procurement as Mr. Hadikar said, uh, to solve the challenge of uh, procurement. Uh, well, the solution fits the problem, but how do we make it easy for uh, procurements there? The third is the uh, definition or lack of definition or lack of it of the market estimation or market access. Demand estimations of various kinds of solutions are uh, very few and far, and also the poor and the slow adoption of those innovations. It is largely limited to B2B or B2G, uh, while the big boys are on the B2C uh, space. Uh, so the large funders who have marketing budgets can afford to go to B2C but the early and mid-stage companies suffer uh, because of that. And finally, the pilots or test beds of new innovations or new approaches are very few. Uh, it is not, uh, in healthcare, you need a large scale of pilots to obtain a certain level of comfort and confirmation. Uh, in one or two or three locations, uh, it may not be enough for, as you write, as Mr. Shavan and, and you said, if 10 municipal corporations or 20 have to take it to scale, those 20 are the scale of pilots, not scale of the solutions, for it to go to 1,000 and more. So uh, healthcare has to be looked a bit differently because it involves the health and wellness of the public. And therefore, multiple pilots reconfirmation in the journey of scale of pilots would also need to do a certain level of re-engineering of the approach or the solution. Um, with these problems and challenges, how are we addressing uh, some of those through the blended finance facility that is being set up, uh, as you rightly said, supported by USAID in technical collaboration with National Health Authority and hosted at Foundation for Innovation and Technology Transfer at IIT Delhi. IP Global is the program manager. So to keep it short, it's a fairly large scale collaboration initiative it starts with the problem identification and demand estimation across the PMJ hospitals using a very robust needs assessment survey methodology, both primary and secondary, not limited to hospitals, but across the value chain of manufacturers, suppliers uh, of the approach and match those problem statements which are quantifiably available with the solutions uh, in the form of healthcare enterprises and innovations. 
uh, we focus only on late stage, which is early revenue and mid revenue stage companies as a specific uh, approach. Uh, so the blended finance facility aims to raise a philanthropy capital of $50 million and leverage that to the extent of five to 10 X. So uh, uh, clearly uh, the plan is to, uh, one of the issues uh, that healthcare enterprises face is ticket size issues, be it small or big. Uh, when they need 100,000, uh, there is nobody available uh, in the system. The market participants on the debt and, and the hybrid finance are limited to banks, NBFCs, and venture debt firms. Either the process of access is very cumbersome or the cost is very high. So uh, low ticket size, low cost, affordable uh, working capital or infrastructure support is what we aim to provide. It is a risk sharing facility that aims to support the healthcare enterprises in removing the bottlenecks towards access of mainstream capital. So the leverage is with the debt and uh, development finance uh, companies with whom we have already partnered uh, with for the leverage of the philanthropy capital. Uh, so I'd like to stop here and welcome. Andrew. Wonderful. No, no, thank you so much, Ravi. And, and you just, I think uh, what you're talking about highlighted another point, right? Which is of uh, not just beneficiary financing, but intermediary financing and uh, access to affordable debt, similar to what Shantanu and SFI is also doing. As an equity investor, we're very conscious of this. You know, we have to be honest. We call ourselves impact investors, but we're basically DCs. So we're looking for market returns and we have a 0.01% selection rate. So many enterprises need liquidity and debt or customer money is often better than equity. And how do they get that affordably? It's one of the biggest challenges. So um, I, I apologize to everyone just for the time management because we have exactly one hour, we run out of time. So we will not be able to take questions, but uh, thank you to all the uh, you know, participants. I think we've got more than 70 people on the call for asking all of these questions. I think one minute to summarize uh, so that all of us can at least have the key takeaways. We covered five key points in this panel, right? We started with looking at an assessment of the market. Dhan walked us through that. What's going well? What are the biggest challenges? And we're seeing the incredible potential that investors see in this space. People like UBS, people like, uh, you know, SFI, uh, IPE, Asha Impact, and many others. The second thing we looked at is the role of government. What shapes their view? What are their priorities? And thank you very much to Mr. Hardikar and to Avneet for talking about that, both from the perspective of the central government and the local government. Then we talked about market building. How can we pool capital, reduce costs, and drive liquidity? And thank you, Shantanu, for, for your leadership here, you know, because we really need people from the corporate sector who are thinking like that, who are working like that, to scale this thing up, to get more capital and to reduce costs. And Shantanu spoke about that. Then the role of government as outcome funder, number four right? That outcome funding is critical and a SIB basically means that government is the outcome funder, otherwise it's a dip. So yeah, India ka pehla SIB hoga actually, if you think about it, if, if, if this happens in PCMC. So that's, that's it's quite remarkable. And finally, what are the right models for public-private collaboration and some of the challenges and the key issues that one faces? So we'll just end by just making it clear for the audience uh, two things. One is why are we even talking about this, right? So this is a good stat to think about. India has a $600 billion financing gap to meet its annual targets annually. Every single year, more than half a trillion is needed to complement the government's budget if we're going to meet the SDG targets. So this is why we talk about it. Because if private capital doesn't come in, it's not going to work, right? So that's the capital. And where will this capital go? We have an opportunity. Because India has the world's largest NGO and social enterprise sector. Three million not-for-profits. 3 million, right? And the third largest startup ecosystem in the world with 50,000 startups, right? And many of these startups are working on social problems, right? But only 600 of these startups out of 50,000 raised roughly $10 billion of capital over a decade. The entire impact investment industry raises $1 billion per year and the need is $600 billion per year. So this is why we're talking about this, you know? And it's wonderful to be uh, be given this platform at Sankal because Sankal is really the preeminent social impact platform for the last decade or more. So I think much more conversation needs to happen on this. Impact investors need to look at this much more seriously and we need to have much more dialogues like this as we can tell. You know, we could probably go on for another few hours. I also apologize to the panelists for not being able to come back to you. But we'll end on that. 
exactly 1.30 p.m. And uh, thanks to all of you. Thank you to Sankal for hosting us and look forward to continuing this dialogue.